Mr. Brian. Um, I, he loves maps. And maybe you remember, it was a year ago I covered for him and I, I called him a cartophile, which means a, someone who loves maps. I'm a geography teacher in my other job at a public high school. And so I, I deal with maps all the time. And I shared this map a year ago, um, the world is a cat playing with Australia. And a lot of people thought that was funny. So I thought I'd continue that trend. We Californians are terrible uh, with geography. Brian loves maps. He's been showing a lot through our series of Joshua. But we Californians basically know California. We know somewhere on the East Coast is New York City. And Texas is somewhere down in the South in the middle. And that's about it. All the other states don't really exist. Um, so to help you with that, uh, Kentucky is fried chicken on the Tennessee plate held by Chef Meemaw, right? You got Minnesota's his hat, and then Iowa's where his eyes are at, and then you've got, you know, Missouri in his middle, and then Arkansas and Louisiana makes the legs. I know, it's cheesy, uh, but maybe, just maybe, you'll remember a few other states. But uh, we're in Joshua 9 tonight, and I'm going to continue where Jason Bell left off last week, who did a great job, and uh, look at what's going on with Gibeon. So this is one more map. It's actually a helpful map, not a cheesy map. So as you turn to Joshua 9, um, just to kind of remind us of the journey that the Israelites have been on, uh, they came up through the promised land around the Dead Sea. So they went from the south, went way east, then came up by the Dead Sea, and then crossed the River Jordan from the east to the west. So they're coming from, you know, the east side, headed back towards the Mediterranean, towards the coast. And when they crossed the River Jordan, they set up their main base camp at Gilgal, or Gilgal, or however you pronounce it. And they, that's where all the women and children and all their supplies and everything are. And then their armies will go out from there to attack. And at first, of course, they did the famous uh, conquering of Jericho. And then they had their big failure, right? And, and weren't able to conquer Ai, or Ai, or however you want to pronounce it. Um, and, and they learned from their mistake that, oh, okay, you need to really follow God's law. The Achan, he kept some of the plunder and, and they had to repent. And then they were able to get, as Jason Bell called it last week, a divine do-over, which is a beautiful title. I loved it. Uh, but this idea they got to do, they make up for their mistake and make it right. And so now Gibeon is the next city in that line, as you see on this map. They're headed west and they're going to attack Gibeon is a city with some other cities connected to it and all the territory in between. The Gibeonites own that region. Now, the Israelites don't really know that. They're just learning about all these places. And, and so they're going to make a major failure again, which is so frustrating. That's what we human beings do all the time, right? We do really well. Then we make a mistake. We're like, oh, I'm never going to do that again. And then we walk right into another mistake after we get a little cocky from another victory. I do that all the time, make all kinds of mistakes and then I think I'm going to learn from them, and then I make another one, and I mess up again and again. And, and so that's something I think we can all uh, relate to. Um, one of the ones that I was thinking of is uh, 10 years ago, I, I came on staff working in Rise High Ministry, and um, it was just a crazy time. My oldest son was starting kindergarten, so that was a whole new reality for my wife and I. And uh, we were in the process of moving. And so my, my schedule is totally different, and I'm driving my... I'd pick my boys up sometimes from school and driving around. They're little guys in the back and, you know, all distracted and I'm distracted. And I, I had a fender bender in Home Depot. I was going slow enough where we really didn't need to do anything about it. But I was like, oh man, I can't do that again. The boys are in the back. And then two weeks later, I had another one in a different parking lot, different situation. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Andrew, you got to wake up from this. But that's, that's the reality. We fail and fail and fail. And what's the beautiful thing that we'll see in this story, hopefully tonight, is that God's grace is there in those failures. And so let me pray as we jump into Joshua 9. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for uh, everybody getting here safely in the rain. Thank you for all the families represented here as kids are in CK or 678 or enjoying a rice high feast. Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every person on this campus. And those who couldn't make it tonight, those who are online and watching from home or um, uh, listening, Lord, I pray that we would be able to learn from your word. Help me not get in the way of that. In your name we pray, amen. amen. So Joshua 9, 1 through 14 is the first section I'm going to take on as we look at uh, failing and finding grace. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland all along the coast of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. 
But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they were on their part, acted with cunning, and went out and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins and worn out torn and mended without worn out patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes. And all their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, perhaps you live among us. How then can we make a covenant with you? They said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? And they said to him, from a very distant country, your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him and all he did in Egypt and all he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Come now, make a covenant with us. Here's our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey on the day we set out to come to you. But now behold, it is dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them. Behold, they have burst. And these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from a very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. So we're going to pause there because that's their mistake. They didn't ask God. They're not supposed to enter into any covenants with the Canaanites. They're supposed to conquer and take all the land. And, and they don't ask. They fail to ask the Lord. Now, this makes me think of the most popular TV shows that's come out recently. Ted Lasso on uh, Apple Plus. Some of you may have watched it. Some of you may have heard of it. I, full disclaimer, I do not have Apple Plus, Apple TV, so I have not really seen any of the, the episodes in full length. Um, I know it has a mature rating, so I'm not really totally promoting it, but its most famous scene, one that has been shared so many times on YouTube and TikTok and other places, is the scene where Ted Lasso challenges this British businessman who's been a bully to a game of darts, and, um, and he just starts talking and monologuing as these throwing darts about how bullies never ask enough questions. They're never curious enough. He says, they're not curious. And he starts hitting bullseye after bullseye after bullseye, talking about how he actually knew how to play darts from a really young kid because he spent that time with his dad playing darts. And then he finally hits this winning one. And he says in his Southern drawl, barbecue sauce, right? And, and, and again, he's like, people just don't ask enough questions. Now, I see this in real life all the time because I have two teenage boys, right? And if you know anything about teenage boys, they have very limited words, especially with adults. Uh, they just don't say much around adults. And so at times, I'm just like, son, you got to ask questions. Like the other day, there was like, hey, why didn't you turn that assignment in? Well, uh, I thought the teacher had changed things because of the assembly. Did you ask? No. You know, and, or the other day, he was like, another son was like, uh, um, I need you to bring my gear. I said, why, why didn't you bring your gear for your practice? He's like, well, the coach said an assistant was going to be running things. Well, did you ask? No, right? He's just not asking enough. And, and that's, that's something that the Israelites failed to do. They failed to ask the Lord, um, just like this you know, cocky British bully businessman or a teenage boy. They're just not asking God the questions. They asked the, the people from Gibeon questions, but they didn't ask God for his counsel, it says there. Um, already they've forgotten their need to rely on the Lord, right? If you missed last Sunday, you should go back and listen to the message. But Jason Honberger, who's right in the back there, he did a great job talking about the need for us to pray, especially when we're in battle, especially when we're facing tough times, especially just recognizing we're constantly in difficult situations. And, um, and, and these Jews should have known that example because Jason, he, he shared about when Moses was praying for the Israelites and holding up his hands over the battle as uh, Joshua led the army against other enemies and Aaron and her were there helping him. And, and that's something that they knew. They knew that story, right? It wasn't that long ago in their history. And they've already forgotten this example of that they are in enemy territory and they need to be constantly asking God for guidance. And, and so because they failed to ask, the, the disguise and the deception of the Gibeonites work. 
How many times do you and I fail to ask God? Um, especially when things are going well. That's the thing. The Israelites just had a great victory over AI, and they're feeling good. They're feeling like, hey, we've got it together. We're back on a roll. Let's get on to the next victory and the next victory. Let's just keep going. And, and they don't slow down to ask God. I think I'm, that's very true of me. When things are going well is when I'm less likely to talk to God than when there's a mess. Of course, God, help. I need you, right? It's like, why didn't you ask earlier? Um, so... Um, so yeah, we fail to ask God when we're excited. We also, sometimes we, we go through the motions, right, of asking God, of praying, but we're not really like seeking him, right? There's a difference of like, saying the words, but truly seeking him. I think we all can relate to that. Um, or sometimes we've asked God, we've sought his counsel, but we're impatient and we don't wait for his answer in his timing. And so that's something I think that's, that both of those are ways we fail like the, the Israelites in this situation, right? We fail to ask God when things are going well or just to ask him because we're excited or because we're busy um, or we fail to wait for his answer, uh, especially in our fast-paced, busy lifestyles that are always pursuing the next pleasure, the next excitement. We're always rushing and we don't slow down and listen for God. And so that's the Israelites' failure and so let's see what happens because of that. Okay, so in picking up in verse 15 of chapter 9, and Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the leaders of the congregation swore to them. And at the end of three days, after they had made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors, and they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, okay, bear with me, I'm not really good at pronouncing these, Shephira, Biroth, and kiriath Jerim. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live. Let the wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. So this passage, obviously, what jumps out in one way, that in their culture, an oath was really, really important, right? A solemn vow carried a lot of weight. And immediately, some of you might be thinking, eh, isn't that a little old-fashioned and out of touch in our current reality here in 2023? Like, who really expects anybody to hold, unless you sign on some kind of contract, where do oaths and promises really play a part in our culture? Well, I want to push back on that a little bit by playing a game, partly because as a former youth minister, I like games. And this room, those of you who were with me back in the day, I see a few of you out there. This room feels like an adult version of the Rise High Room, doesn't it? It's like kind of shallow stage, flat rows, sound booth in the back and all that. So um, especially for my yams, rams, thank you guys for being here. Uh, We're going to play a little game, okay? So I'm going to read you some lyrics from songs about promises and vows and things like that. And you guys need to guess who's the artist or what's the title of the song. Okay, so we're going to start with a more recent one for our young people. And then we'll move to older and see how it goes. So our first song, song one, and I'm not going to sing. Full disclosure, that might throw you off more. Um, I know we weren't perfect, but I've never felt this way for no one. And I just can't imagine how you could be so okay now that I'm gone. Guess you didn't mean what you wrote in that song about me because you said forever, now I drive alone past your street. And the answer is Olivia Rodrigo, driver's license. Very good. I should have a prize and throw out stuff. Okay, excellent job. Some of you are like, who's that? I've never heard of her, right? All right, so we're going to go a little older, but less lyrics. So it's going to get, this one should be pretty easy, even though it's less lyrics. We'll see, at least for my generation it is. I swear, by the moon and stars in the sky, I'll be there. I swear. And some of you are starting to sing, right? And that is all for one. That's right. Okay, I swear. And that's the better version. I know there was a popular country version later, but as an R&B fan of the 90s, the all for one version is the best version. Okay, all right. We're going even older. Here we go. Okay. Even less lyrics, song three, an angel smile is what you sell. You promise me heaven, then put me through hell. Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi, that's right. What's the song? (laughs) You give love a bad name. We should almost do a karaoke, right? Shot through the heart and you're to blame. Oh, come on, people. A bad name. Right. Now, Jason Bell last week said that 80s and 90s music was better. I, 
Would we agree? No, yeah, you guys aren't helping me out here. But, um, but here's my real point. If promises and vows didn't mean anything, even the ones that we say kind of in passing like these songs imply, then so many songwriters and artists wouldn't have a career. I mean, literally Adele would have nothing if we didn't have this idea that vows matter, that oaths matter, right? So many songs and poems and stories throughout the ages from all kinds of cultures and people groups show that promises mean something, that love demands a vow. It demands a covenant that we should be entering into sacred promises to show our love, right? Um, And when those promises are broken, you know, things that we say in those moments, okay, that we don't follow through on and how much it hurts, like we saw in some of those lyrics, right? And some of you know that pain very, very well, that broken heart, that feeling of disappointment and hurt and betrayal because someone didn't keep their promise, said or unsaid, right? Um, Jason last week, Jason Bell last week shared that God's promises can be trusted, period, no question mark, which I thought was a great, great way of putting it. But God, I would go a step further, God created us in his image and that he intended us to be promise keepers. He intended us to fulfill our vows. That's how we show we're his children because we are faithful and true like him. And so that's in keeping and that's important to keep in mind as we look at this moment. This is actually a really key moment of faith and decision that the leaders of the Israelites and Joshua have here because they have a choice. Do they follow the vow that they made or not? right? Because it's very obvious the Gibeonites lied to them. They were tricked. The Gibeonites aren't who they said they were. And the Israelites had made a vow with them, though, a solemn vow. It says to live at peace with them and not destroy them. And they had sworn it by the Lord, right? Now, that, that phrase, by the Lord, meant that this was not just and they had asked him to enter into a covenant. This isn't just some like, hey, you guys are going to treat us right. Yeah, okay, okay, good. No, this is more, this is like a ceremony was done. We're not sure, right? This is hundreds of years later than when Abraham made a covenant with God. But we know from that story in Genesis that there's this powerful imagery that they usually did in the ancient Middle East when it came to making a solemn vow. They would take livestock and they would cut them in half, right? They'd butcher the animal and they put the left part of the carcasses in a row on one side and the right part of the carcasses in a row on another side. And then the two parties, the two people who are making this vow would walk through the middle of those carcasses, right? And the symbolism was, if I don't fulfill my end of my vow, of my covenant, let what happened to those animals happen to me, right? That this covenant carries the penalty of death, right? That's the kind of vow that these Israelites have made with them because they said, we don't want to break our vow lest the wrath of God comes upon us. Okay, so this is a a crucial moment and the leaders know no matter, even if they lied, we still have to follow through on our promise, which is crazy to us, right? We would think that's a breach of contract. Boom, we don't have to follow through. They lied. They didn't present themselves correctly. But it doesn't matter in this case, right? Right? And, and that's why the people are grumbling. It says they're kind of murmuring against the leaders, right? They're like, they lied. We don't need to keep this promise. Let's wipe them out. Why do we have to keep the promise? They lied to us. They're angry about it. That's how I would be. I hate being lied to. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. I don't handle it well. Um, and I don't know if they say I need to, but I, it's something I struggle with. Um, but others probably are not just upset about the lie, but they're also fearful that, oh, shoot, we messed up again. Just like when Achan kept the plunder, we're going to get busted. God's going to send some kind of plague on us or something bad's going to happen in the next battle. We're going to have a lot of people die. We messed up again. We got to do this right. Like, what do we do? Right. They have a lot of fear of this failure and the consequences from it because they didn't ask God. And then others are probably a little bit greedy too or disappointed because now they realize, well, if we're not going to wipe out the Gibeonites, they get to keep their cities. They get to keep the land in between the cities. We're going to get less land. We're not going to get all the promised land that we were supposed to get. That means less land for our families and our future grandchildren and all that stuff. Does that make sense? They're now going to miss out because of this vow that they've made. 
Okay, so there's a lot of mixed angry emotions there, and that's why they're murmuring against the leaders, but the leader's like, hey, we made a solemn oath. We have to follow through on this. They know two wrongs don't make a right. Um, They were tricked into making an oath that they shouldn't have, but to break that oath before the Lord would mean they were liars too, right? They had sworn by God to do this, and they can't go back on their word. Otherwise, they're just as bad as them. And they're not being the people of God that they're supposed to be. And you'll see this vow carries some consequences, some costs to it. In the next chapter, okay, the, the Gibeonites actually are under attack and Joshua sends the army to protect them, right? They're now under his care because of this vow they've made. And, and so that puts them at risk. And centuries later, okay, God still expects them to follow on this vow And he sends a plague, uh, a drought and famine on Israel because King Saul had forgotten this vow and tried to wipe out the Gibeonites and not keep this promise. And King David finds out about it. And he's like, what's going on? And he realizes, oh my gosh, we're supposed to still hold true to our promise to the Gibeonites hundreds of years later. So what does that mean for us today? What does it mean to have all these sacred promises and what we're seeing here? for our jobs, for relationships? Well, I say one, we should be careful about who, what, when, and when, and how we make our promises, right? We want to be careful about what we say. Jesus famously said once, let your yes be yes and your no be no, right? If we claim to follow God, let's be trustworthy. Let's be faithful. Let's not give in to emotion or hype or overpromise and undersell like so many in our crazy marketing world do. Um, When we make a vow or make a solemn promise, we are supposed to hold up our end, even if it's hard or difficult or it comes at a sacrifice, instead of, you know, cutting and run. Secondly, uh, oaths obviously are challenging, right? God expects us to be faithful, but we also have to work hard at them, okay? Um, And that's where we show our commitment, right? Let's not be so quick to abandon our friends or to ignore our coworkers, We can't make every relationship work. I'm not saying that we have to be great friends to every single person and be all good because it takes two, right? But as Paul says in Romans 12, as far as you can, live at peace with everyone. It doesn't just say some, it says with everyone, okay? You show up, you be there. If they reject you, that's on them, but at least you're doing your part of being their friend, of being their colleague, of being that whatever it is in that situation, Um, Of course, we need to have healthy boundaries and use our time well, but if you've made a promise, if you've been communicating, whether verbally or non-verbally, that you care about this person and you're going to be there for them, then make those sacrifices that show that commitment. Um, And I especially want to encourage you those in tough family situations. Um, I know people who feel they were tricked and they married the wrong person, and that's a sad, tough thing. I know some of you laugh. (laughs) Maybe you felt that at some way point. But it's also a very sad situation, right? Um, And uh, there's one author who one time famously said, kind of grab people's attention, you always marry the wrong person. And what they didn't mean that marriage is wrong or that it's a bad uh, institution. What he was communicating there was that we are all flawed. We are all imperfect. We can't love each other perfectly. And no one is going to live up to the impossible romantic ideals that our songs and movies present in our culture. Um, We all change, right? I always think it's funny when people say, well, you're not the person I married. Thank God, right? Like we're supposed to grow and change and improve and and go through stuff. And that's what makes a long-lasting marriage so impactful on people around it is that they've stuck together through all the ups and downs and hurts and especially the hurts and disappointments they've inflicted on each other, okay? Because they're flawed, because they do things wrong, and they're not perfect. Um, And that doesn't just apply to marriages, right? As parents, it's hard with our kids. Some of you had really difficult relationships with your parents as sons and daughters. You have a tough time with your siblings, your brothers and sisters. Um, and, And I think if we think about the commitments we have towards our family members, Are we willing to continue to show up and especially to forgive? Jesus famously said, you need to forgive 70 times seven, which was an exaggeration to make the point, you forgive as much as it takes. 
because that's what he does for us. That's how we show that we have his love inside of us. Um, I think the reason that I'm so stuck on this idea of falling through on commitments when it's hard and when it hurts is because next week I'm going to Thanksgiving with a lot of family and many of you are too. And as much as that sounds great, we also know there's that one family member who's going to be there. That one, uh, you know, whether it be brother, sister, or aunt or uncle, or grandma, grandpa, or cousin who have hurt us, disappointed us, ignored us. I mean, some of our deepest hurts come from our family. Am I right? And that's hard. And some of us are, are already having like, you're having like night sweats or nightmares. Or you're, you're thinking through how it's going to be when you see them. Are you going to give them a hug? Like you're going through all the motions. And you're like, how do I, do I have to show up for them? Are you saying that I need to be there for them? And I'm kind of saying, yeah. You, I know there's boundaries and it's complicated. You need to talk that through afterwards. Please come talk to me. I don't know all the answers to that. But I do know whether I said something or not, there's a deep commitment I have to family just because we are family. Um, you know, my wife, who right now is covering the Fost Adopt group, and she works with adoptive kids and foster kids um, all the time with her adoption agency. And something that you see happen over and over again is that adopted kids seek out their family over and over again, even if it's like a stepbrother you know, type of situation, even if it's their mom and dad, who they're the reason why they ended up in the system, why they have so much trauma in their life, is there's something powerful about the need for family. And it shapes so much of our identity. And, and so we can't avoid it. It's, it's in our DNA to want to be part of a family. And so if we know that, even though it's been painful and hurtful and it's hard, we show up for family as best as we can because we have Jesus' love inside of us. Does that make sense? And so I, and I say that not as someone who has it all right, but as someone who's struggling with that and wants to just encourage you guys to keep in that struggle. Don't give up, right? And show up next week, however awkward it is. Um, but so I guess when we're looking at oaths and promises, let's be careful about what we promise, how we promise, and let's be faithful. Um, remember that oaths are challenging, and finally that God cares about the oaths we make. Like we see how he holds Israel accountable even hundreds of years later. Um, He expects people to be faithful and true. Now that doesn't mean you should avoid making commitments. I know some of you have been accused of being commitment phobic, and you don't like to enter into some kind of, you know, situation, but I'm not encouraging that. In fact, I'm saying the opposite, that you should be willing to enter into commitments. You should be entered to make promises because it's an act of faith, right? You're stepping out and saying, okay, I'm not quite sure how this is going to play, but I'm trusting that because God is with me and he cares about oaths and promises and expects me to be faithful and true, he's going to see me through it. However it turns out, he's going to help me and do that. And that's what Joshua and his leaders are doing. They're like, yes, the giving night slide. Yes, they're not the people who they presented themselves to be. But we are going to trust that God is going to see us through this situation in this vow we've made. Does that make sense? And that's tough. But that's what they do. And, and that's where faithfulness is really proven, right? And through tough times, through the sacrifices, through the hard ups and downs. That's what Jesus showed on the cross. And that's when we show ourselves to be like him. So what happens because of this vow that the Israelites enter into? So let's finish the chapter, uh, verses 21 through 27. And the leaders said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said of them. Joshua summoned them and he said to them, why did you deceive us saying, we are very far from you when you dwell among us? Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua, because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. And now, behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight, do to us. Do it. So he said to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel, and they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place that he should choose. So Joshua and the Israelites give 
the Gibeonites mercy and grace, not because they deserve it, but because of their promise before God. Remember, by definition, mercy and grace are undeserved. Let's remember that when we see people, like when we give people mercy and grace, we don't make them earn it, then it's not mercy and grace anymore, right? It's undeserved. It's a gift. You know, Brian shared when he started this series that Joshua means the Lord saves. And that was the actual name of Jesus. Jesus is the Greek version of Joshua, Yeshua, right? And Joshua, he does curse the Gibeonites, but he it emphasizes that he saves them too from destruction, right? They're not killed. And so he's living up to his name. And they accept this role. And I think maybe that's why God spares them. Um, ultimately, it's because of his plan. But you love the humility that the Gibeonites show. They don't fight it. They don't deny it. They say, do it. Do it to us, whatever you see fit. Right? They accept, partly because they made a covenant too. They made a covenant to be servants in that, in that special ceremony. They don't grumble or fight or argue. And remember, the reason they, they did this whole charade was because they've recognized God's plan for the Israelites to conquer Canaan from the beginning, and they know they can't stop it. They respect God enough to like, we can't fight this God. We can't fight this people. And so they figured better to join them than to fight them, and they had to lie to do that. They're like Rahab in a sense. Rahab, a prostitute, not some moral standing person, right? A prostitute who and it was another Canaanite, who God spared because she also recognized to fight God is foolish. To deny that God is in charge is dumb. And so the Gibeonites went through the deception and even their deception shows humility. They don't come in all like powerful or strong or showing how great they are. They pretend to be weary, worn travelers with terrible food and, you know, uh, torn up clothes. They're basically homeless. Um, And now they weren't really homeless, but that's the that they're presenting themselves as no, nothing special. Um, they were desperate to avoid destruction and knew they couldn't defeat God and his plan. And so there's some humility there. Um, now, I'm not encouraging lying. Again, remember my pet peeve, I hate lying. But I am reminded of Proverbs where so many times it talks about the importance of humility. In Proverbs 16, 18 through 19, it says, pride goes before the destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud, right? So these Gibeonites, the Canaanite people, are desperate to escape destruction and to be saved, and they've humbled themselves in their response to Joshua's curse, right? In this second meeting, when everybody's now really who they are, they're like, just accept it. They show humility. They have no right to bargain. They know it. And they accept the role of servants in providing wood and water. You know, later, centuries later, the other Joshua, Jesus, he's approached by a Canaanite woman or a Gentile woman, but it could be translated a Canaanite woman. And she's asking for healing for her daughter. And she's loud and obnoxious as she's calling out for Jesus and his disciples to come over and heal her daughter. And the disciples are annoyed and they tell her to kind of go away. And they tell Jesus, can you just tell her to be quiet? And he's, he's harsh. He says, hey, woman, it's not right to take bread from the children to give to the dogs. I mean, that's tough, right? But she doesn't fight that or get offended. Not saying that she didn't necessarily, that's a, that's a tough word, but she's desperate for Jesus's help. And so she responds, even the dogs get crumbs from the table. And her humility and faith are so impressive to Jesus that he heals her daughter. Like Peter and James both write in their letters, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So we see a powerful image of humility in the Gibeonites when they meet Joshua the second time. And that leads to their experience of grace and mercy. Um, The Gibeonites lie and fail into grace. The Israelites ignore God and they also, in that failure, find grace, right? They're not killed or hurt in their next battle for failing to ask God. In fact, they get some laborers to help them in their new country that they're in. Um, It's not ideal, but still, there's no experience of wrath. And the Israelites do the right thing by honoring the Gibeonites, or I shouldn't say they honor the Gibeonites, but they honor their oath to the Gibeonites. And even if the Gibeonites don't deserve it, Because they remember they don't deserve God's mercy either after all the times that they've offended God and failed him in the desert and all that. God's grace is amazing as the famous hymn says, 
And through grace, the Gibeonites go from false humility to humble servants. They go from enemies of God to protected by God. The Israelites fail to ask God, and yet they get help they didn't ask for, right? But there's one other group of people I want to look at that I've skipped over, right? Way back at the very beginning of chapter 9, it talks about how these other Canaanite kings came together as one to fight against Joshua and God's people. And they don't get grace, right? They have decided to wage war against God's plan. They're not going to humble themselves. They're not going to bow down. They are going to fight it. Um, You know, John Milton, he wrote a classic book long time ago called Paradise Lost. And it's this kind of this image of heaven and hell and stuff. And there's this famous uh, line that Satan in that book says. He says, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. And that's been quoted by so many people and repeated in so many different ways and different, you know, plays and songs and poetry. Uh, because it's an attitude that a lot of people identify with, unfortunately, that there's more freedom without God than with him. Um, So many people leave the church. They leave our faith. They ignore God because deep down they think God is restricting, enslaving someone who shouldn't be trusted. And these Canaanite kings are showing that same attitude. They'd rather fight and die than to bow down towards God. Um, And, and, I I know so many people feel that way in different ways, and you probably have felt that way at some point, or maybe you've been around people like that. And I just want to push back on that a little bit, that the idea that God is so restrictive, right? Because we have to think about what do we really mean by freedom, right? So uh, let me give you this analogy that I've heard from many people. Uh, There's uh, fish, they could fight the boundaries that water provides for them, but then they die. But if they stay within the bounds of the ocean or in the lake. They're able to move so beautifully. They're able to breathe and live the way they were designed to. And the same is for you and me. When we live within God's you know, laws and boundaries, when we live in relationship with him, we find our true freedom in him. We are able to live and move and breathe the way we're designed to. Being in relationship with God, serving him, isn't restricting. It should feel like home because that's what we were made for. Um, And the Israelites are learning this in their journey with God, especially as they fulfill this difficult vow that they know they shouldn't have made and it feels all wrong. But they're learning that, hey, being with God, even when it's hard and following his law of fulfilling a vow is more freedom than not. The Gibeonites are going to learn this as they experience what it's like to serve God's community and even the worship at the temple. Um, And I pray that you would continue to see God and experience that kind of freedom of being with him. In many ways, we're seeing three classic ways people respond or react to God and his plan. We see defiance in the Canaanite kings, which leads to destruction. We see deception by the Gibeonites, which, interestingly, God plays along with, right? And I think that's very true. I know a lot of people who, their conversion story starts something like this, like, well, God, if you get me out of this mess, I'll show up to church next week, right? Now, are they really pursuing God? No, they just want to get out that mess. But then it works, and they're like, well, maybe I'll go, and then another thing happens and they really aren't serious about God, but they want a better career or they want their kids to have some kind of moral instruction or whatever the reason, they don't really want God, but God plays along and all of a sudden they realize what I really want is God. All these other things that I thought I wanted isn't what I needed, it's him that I need. And when they realize that, they become like the Israelites and later the Gibeonites and they defer, they have deference or they submit and obey God. Um, We can fail and find God's grace again and again because he loves us and he knows and his plan is perfect and he knows how to make this all happen. Um, I'm not encouraging failing, but we know that God is good and he has a master plan and we can't screw it up. Um, and, And that's because Jesus already has the victory. He became a true wandering servant, a true person who had torn clothes and poverty and he was cursed on the cross Um, not because he failed to live up to a promise, but he took our failure of not living up to all the promises that we were supposed to follow, and and he took that punishment. And then we get to live in freedom with God because 
it's as if Jesus' faithfulness to all those covenants, to all, that, um, all those promises are our successes, as our faithfulness. And we get to experience what it's like to be in relationship with God and to find our true selves in him. If you think about it, that should fill you with wonder and awe and praise as we have our home in Jesus through his grace. Thank you.